Good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you, wherever on this beautiful globe you may be. I'm Raquel Ferreira from Gifts Coordination Team. Welcome to the final day of the General Stewards Meeting. We hope you have thoroughly enjoyed all of our sessions and discussions thus far. Today we have three very important sessions on the agenda. This session is on information systems in public financial management. Translation is available in French, um, so please use the interpretation button that appears at the bottom of your screen if you would prefer to listen to the conversation in French. Uh, after the session, we're going to have a session on innovative uses of fiscal transparency data for gender purposes. That will be at 9 a.m. And finally, the closing session of the meeting, um, that is the next step session, will take place at 10.30 a.m. Over the past three decades, the provision of information within public financial management has been revolutionized by financial management information systems. These automated solutions for planning, executing, and monitoring revenue and expenditure form an integral part of the public financial management system. However, across the world, they, and perhaps more particularly, the integrated uh, financial management information systems have unfortunately fallen short in their objectives of facilitating data-driven decision-making, timely and smooth budget execution, integrated service delivery, mitigating against wasteful expenditure, and importantly, increasing transparency, participation, and accountability. Our colleagues from the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, that is CABRI, one of our stewards, have done extensive work in this regard. And today it is our privilege to have them here to share key insights with us to facilitate peer learning within our network. This session will be facilitated by Neil Cole, um, the Executive Secretary of CABRI. Uh, without further ado, I will thus hand over the floor to our distinguished colleague. Please go ahead, Neil. Thank you very much, Rachel, um, and, and just thank you for the opportunity um, for um, Cabri to participate in um, the week's activities. I um, apologize that I've not been able to um, participate in, in, in most of your sessions, um, but my colleague, um, Danielle, and, and also um, you know, officials that we work with across Africa have been participating in really interesting weeks um, of, of discussions. Um, so as Rachel has said, uh, my name is, is Neil Cole. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, and I have um, very close um, uh, colleagues, uh, peers, um, acquaintances, and some that I even, would even call friends um, that I have on the panel uh, today. And I will um, use the opportunity a bit later to, to introduce um, the panelists. Um, as, as an introduction, let me say, Rachel, I'm, I'm not too sure that we can say that we've done extensive work in, in, in IFMIS, um, but we've certainly um, come Neil, you seem to be frozen. Looks like we, we lost him. Yeah, I think we, maybe let's see. He'll come back. Just give him a few more seconds um, and then we can see if he doesn't return, then we can make a plan. Sure. Thank you.
I mean, we've been lucky this week, you know, on, on all the sessions. Most of the time we made it through, but it's true that uh, yesterday we had one uh, with some accidents and, and, and now today, but uh, uh, in general, we've been quite lucky. I thank you for your patience and for your presence, which brings us luck. If Neil hasn't re re um, returned in about two minutes, I'm happy to take over the session. So let's just see what happens. That's Daniel. Don't worry. This, Thank this you, is, Daniel. This is the indication for all of us to go grab a cup of coffee. I'll be right back. Yes, let's do that. Uh, let's take a two minute break. Neil is back. Yeah, he's back. Oh, is Neil back? Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Looks like I'm back. You're back. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome I, back, Neil. I apologize. I suppose this is just um, something that we have to get used to. Um, so as I was saying that um, when, when I believe I did get um, cut off, is that um, I wouldn't say that we have done extensive work in, in IFMA systems but what we certainly have um, come across in our work with um, ministries of finance across Africa is that countries um, have um, faced challenges in the design and the implementation of um, financial management information systems. There are certainly um, many success stories, um, but there are also many, many failures. And unfortunately, some of those failures have been linked to also cases of, of corruption. If one thinks of um, what, was, what was known as, as Cashgate in Malawi, um, the IFMA system was strongly linked to that. Um, if one looks at the, the failure in the implementation of an IFMA system in South Africa, um, there's an on, there are ongoing investigations with regard to the question of what went what went wrong, so there's been um, a mixed bag um, when it comes to the implementation of of IFMA. We seem to have lost Neil again. Raquel, what would you suggest? Should I take over? I, I think you can. And then um, when we when get Neil us. back, yeah. So I think, yeah, okay. perhaps do that. Yeah. All Thank right. you, okay. Danielle. Sure thing. Let me just turn my camera on. Yeah, so as Neil was saying, this is our sort of first foray into information systems. We've been working over the past year to understand what really contributes to these systems working well or not working so well. Um, given that they have become such an integral part of um, PFM more broadly. But um, I don't know, I think uh, Neil has a presentation. And I wonder if I should start on that. Um, give me one second. I think maybe I'll just run you through his presentation very quickly. And hopefully if he comes, he'll take over from me. Just sharing my screen. Okay. So yeah, as we've already said, functional PFM depends very much on accurate, comprehensive information sharing, and this has been revolutionized by information systems in PFM. So this is, our work in this is, as we said, begun over the past year. And what we continuously notice, as many others have noticed, is that despite huge volumes of money 
both from development partners and domestic governments, IFMAS projects and IFMAS related ICT solutions just haven't really brought about the results we want in terms of recording, reporting, information sharing, and data analysis also remains suboptimal across countries. So I have this nice little thing that I shared with Neil from the Lesotho Times, and it says, just what is this ifmus animal that has caused so much pandemonium in our drinking halls? Of late, Bacchus has been hearing this acronym a lot, even from people who have never seen a blackboard in their lives. It's now the common alibi that some of my boozing mates use to pass the round. So essentially it talks about how this is to blame for delays in salaries and how payments have been stuck in the treasury because there are problems with financial programs. And I know from my work in Lesotho that this is carried on to this very day being a problem and it's not unique to Lesotho either. So what, how we've decided to respond is develop a policy dialogue and Capri's policy dialogues are essentially, we base them on research, so we do extensive case studies and the the case studies look into different countries, what's going on on the ground, what's working, what's not, and try to develop trends and analysis so that we can tailor a policy dialogue or an in-person peer exchange event more effectively. So then we bring together, uh, you, we would have had this in April if it wasn't for COVID, but we would have um, brought together officials from IT departments, from the Accountant General's office, and from the Budget office, to really discuss what's going on in their countries and across countries. So um, some of the things that we've already started looking at are what kind of capabilities are necessary for effectively utilizing information systems. And that's something, a really bread and butter basic issue that if it's not dealt with, your information system becomes an, just an expensive architectural shell really. And then we also looked at challenges and successes in integration, um, we've also looked at, given the challenges and in integration, some of the alternatives like the modular approach and transversal systems, specifically South Africa's. Um, we're also looking at PFM and the age of digitalization and big data, what this means for countries, what needs to be in place before, and then extending the institutional coverage, whether that's to government owned entities or even just beyond the Ministry of Finance, what does that rollout process entail and what leads to most success? And obviously, as decentralization continues on its prolific path, that will, that will become even more important. And we've also started looking, we had a webinar a few weeks ago, some of you may have attended, and Lorena actually presented there, um, on financial management systems in times of crisis. So how do you balance flexibility and accountability? And how do these systems become a boon in these times to get money out quickly, but also to ensure that money is spent well? Um, Quite quickly, some of the, um, the, the information we've already started finding out from our case studies, and um, this particular one is on in, um, extending the institutional coverage of an IFMAS. And here we look at um, the, 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 some of the key lessons would include that phasing the rollout incrementally and allowing for adaptation is essential. A lot of people would know that already, but from our approach, it's slightly, it's slightly more problem driven. It's taking one step back and saying we need to iterate, we need to adapt, and we need to make sure the system isn't just plugged in to solve a problem that we don't really understand. And many stakeholders in the expenditure chain also lack budget and accounting expertise, and they don't receive the required targeted training that they need. So that's beyond the Ministry of Finance specifically. We also know that the wider institutional coverage of an information system allows for rapid and accountable responses in a crisis. And this is something I hope Mr. McQuende from Rwanda will share with us, how the fact that it was, the whole country was covered essentially by this information system allowed for a faster response during COVID-19. And also we found that performance audit is essential to ensure that the platform is robust, secure, and fully operational at a reasonable speed. We've also seen that entities with internally generated funds, and this is something Sam from Nigeria can speak to, those with in, uh, internally generated funds who are less dependent on central government or the Ministry of Finance have little incentive to use information systems. So the approach there needs to be quite different. Um, finally, some data gap capability gaps that we've noticed, and this work will lead to an online workshop with Ministries of Finance and um, so budget, accounting, um, um, IFMAS coordinators on the 16th of September, 
we'll really try and diagnose what are the core capabilities that are missing ahead of ahead of, for both users for data capturers for end users those who need to, to use um, information for analysis and also amongst the design and maintenance team so some of the things we found from guinea car ethiopia and ghana in this case study is that skill transfer is limited primarily due to the recourse to financial to, uh, to foreign it experts and also there's missed opportunities to learn from older more experienced staff members for various functions so there's a lot of institutional memory that's not leveraged. We also see that cap capa capability building is oriented towards data capture rather than data analysis. And without data analytics, you can't really start understanding trends and correlations, which prevents optimal decision making. So that's some of the highlights that we've for, um, we've got. It, we've obviously we've, we've developed case studies, and we'll share them with the GIF network as we go along. And um, we'll also be inviting our member countries to these events. But yeah, so that's that's about it. And then, I don't know if we now have Neil back with us, Lorena or Raquel? You're um, Daniel, I am back. Um, okay, great. Daniel, I am back. Um, but my connection is going to um, fade in and out. Um, so I, I, I'm going to stay, um, on the call and try to um, participate as much as I can, um, but maybe f just to ensure um, a coherent program, I, I think it would be best if you um, retain the facilitator's role. Sure, I don't, that's fine with me, as long as we get a lot of inputs from the audience, as I haven't prepared very much, and but our panelists will be will be providing us with most of the insights anyway. So um, for our panelists, if I can just introduce everyone, can you turn your cameras on, all panelists, please? From Benin, Nigeria, Argentina. I don't know if we now have Ghana with us. Seems not, unfortunately. Benin is here. Thank you. Okay, great. So we have um, Francois Bigpond, director from the Ministry of Finance and Economy in Benin. We also have Samuel Amenka, the technical advisor to the director general in the budget office of the Federation of Nigeria. We have Gustavo Marino, director of the IT department, Ministry of Economy in Argentina. We have Placid Mcquende, IFMIS coordinator at the Ministry of Finance wonder and unfortunately we seem to be missing Nana Minta who's the head of the budget technical assistance and support unit hopefully he'll still come on because he was going to reflect he says he's, he, he is saying he's still trying to join so I'll leave his question for later on but he's going to provide us with some really interesting insight into a system that they've developed locally in response to a local problem but if I can turn to Placide first um, Mr. McQuinde could you um, share your experience with data capability building and provide us with insight into the data capabilities amongst various users of the IFMIS and what Rwanda's approach to capab capability and capacity building has been? Okay, okay. thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Raquel, and the member of the panel. Uh, uh, the Rwanda experience uh, to the data capability and the, the way we are using IFMIS to help our uh, users, we can't say Rwanda is because we, the education of all our users is not that high. It's like any other rest of African country. But uh, coming to the modernization of IFMIS, how are we using IFIMIS as a tool that will help users even to do their work easily, quickly? Okay, uh, let me just share with you a short uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, you know it, okay. Daniel, you know this uh, uh, screenshot well. Uh, 
In Rwanda, what we did to build the IFIMIS, as you can see, we tried actually to build a system because it's in-house by building a system like, which will be some sort of questionnaire where people, they may fill form, forms that is related to their normal work. For example, if you are to say you are going to build a system such that you don't need an accountant, we build processes, a process that is going to ask somebody, are you going for a mission? Yes. Who is going for a mission? Where the person is going to and so on. Then they are going to fill the data. Now, the logic of accounting and so on, it's built now in the system. During the approval processes, the system will be creating transactions, the debit and credit. You understand in this case, the whole debit and credit is built inside the system without the user's knowledge. At the end, what users will do is to simply come and produce financial report. And to produce financial report, you simply have to say, okay, this is where you have to click to produce this financial statement. Now, and this has helped us actually to have uh, the EFIMIS to cover most of the entities, including having the IFIMIS rolled out to even health centers, schools, and IFIMIS being used by people who don't have knowledge of accounting. For example, at the school level, some people, they don't have knowledge of accounting. However, they can still use the system and report financially. Because what we are doing is to build processes. Instead of saying you need to be an accountant, it's like a planning. A planning may, a planner, what need to know is simply to say, how do you do we produce accurate, a smart a indicator? How do I create target and so on? And then the, by filling those forms, the person will be creating an action plan. You understand? We can build a results-based management system when not everybody has got the proper training of result-based management by simply building a system which will help the user to, to feel comfortable to use it without requiring technical skills in specific areas. Uh, and the, another point, it's um, coming to the point, for example here, whenever you are building system, this is an example of a payroll. We try to say, if a user want to prove, to approve the, a payroll, what the user will need to see is to see, for example, the payroll changes, what, what changed in the payroll. And now, if you are to see, for example, who were the beneficiary of changes, means you are comparing the previous month with the current month, and who what was the changes. Then you understand, if person who is approving the payroll doesn't have great knowledge in uh, preparing a payroll. What simply will come is to come and see, oh, these are the changes for these people and what is the supporting document? The supporting document will be in the system right away. Other thing, the last one is to have a system which is integrated across with other systems. For example, whenever you integrate a system with the central bank, you understand if all the process have been obeyed within IFMIS, now the payment will reach to the commercial bank without any error. You understand in this case, if you have prepared your payroll well for this month, next month you can simply pay by clicking without doing any input. Even if you replace the human resource, then the replacing person will come and do the same click. You understand in that case, you can pay and the changes will come only when there is a change in the organization structure and so on. I think those are the major important points. The last is to build actually a system by moving IFIMIS from management information to a decision support system. And this is where we are heading. We have started this journey maybe next year and so on, we might have a forum 
where we shall might present the new vision of building an FMS. Thank you. Excellent. I'm very excited to have that session or to see what comes out of that. So if we can turn to the representative from Benin now, and if you can please share with us any lessons that you've learned while rolling out SIGFIB and the second version to um, beyond the Ministry of Finance and any plans that you have to introduce a standard financial management information system to municipalities. I know that hasn't been funded or f finalized yet, but I do understand that there are plans. So if you can just think, tell us about some of the difficulties you anticipate and how you will mitigate against these, just so that other countries can better understand some of the difficulties in extending the institutional coverage of these systems. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. My name is Francois Beckbaum. I've been introduced already, but I'm the uh, Director of Information at the uh, Budget Office, National Budget Office in Benin. Benin. Uh, in terms of our experience in Benin, we have a FMES system that was put into place gradually, step by step, as it was developed uh, based on our needs. So we don't have just one system that does everything, in other words, uh, to, um, uh, we don't have, we do have Secrypt, that's our system to manage public spending. And then we have another system called ASTEM for pay and or for salaries we have another system to manage that information and then we also so it's a system that we've been building as we go along and but in terms of our fmes we have tried to make sure that all these systems even though they're separate do communicate amongst each other so for taxes, for just, uh, customs, for all the different departments, there is a financial management system. Uh, for example, the tax office, there's one uh, that helps us to manage uh, tax revenues. And then at the customs uh, service, there's also a financial information management system. But in terms of public finance management, uh, and more specifically expenditure. Uh, if you will allow me, I will share my screen so that you can see what we've been doing. So let me give you a little information about our uh, financial management system for public expenditure. This system that we call SIGFIP uh, and I'm going to focus on four points. I'm going to explain what our system is. I'll talk about our functional coverage. I'll talk about some of the major project progress we've made and then our uh, plans for the future. Now, what is SIGFIP? As you know, it's a, a system that we set up ourselves with a South-South partnership with Cote d'Ivoire, a neighboring country. So it is a system that was set up for the uh, management of public expenditure. And currently, this system is, uh, is interconnected in real time with all the different ministries and state institutions, and also with 12 uh, prefectures. This system has been operational uh, since 2001. Uh, this system has gone through various stages to adapt to the current context. Within the system, every actor can carry out the tasks necessary within its budget. As regards functional coverage, this system allows or makes, makes it possible to commit expenditures the um, 
contracting aspect is already taken into account. Management, payments, all of these functions are within the system. All of the actors in the chain of public expenditures are able to work within this system. Here they are, the credit managers, project coordinators, uh, the uh, or, or agents and uh, organizing entities, uh, financial controller, ac accountants, observers. And so we look at all the different budget statistics to access the system. As, as regards details, the system has advanced greatly among these uh, uh, this progress among among these types of progress we've uh, we've managed donors with all the partners in Benin we have followed the details of the financing and the execution related to the same as the system has advanced we have integrated the nomenclature for um, uh, documents, backup documents. Um, the system ensures its own interoperability as regards urban planning. It's a completely interoperable system. It has SIG tax for taxes, so-called with payroll, and then the SIG FP system is now being built to, to replace these. There is the payment of titles with Matcoast and it also works with the Boost platform. This system transfers data to the public accounting system, Aster. There were specific management tasks within the system I won't go too much into the details. So when President Talon came into office, he asked that all the advantages, all the bonuses to government personnel be traced individually in the system. We were able to manage to put this in place such that through this system instantaneously, we are able to see what government employees, military or civil employees have benefited from in terms of bonuses and so forth. The system has evolved a great deal within uh, the UEMOA. Uh, and so we will need to recreate, to modernize uh, this system with the European Union, we are building a new system that we'll be calling SIGFP, which will cover functionally six areas. So referential preparation of the budget, execution, accounting, interfaces, and a decision-making system. To date, it must be said, these six areas are, e are each operating differently with the new system that the European Union is financing to assist us in finalizing its construction, it, this becomes an area in which you can find all of these various areas, referential, budget preparation, and so forth, is a completely integrated system that will revolutionize within the next year the operation of public finances in the Republic of Benin. Monsieur uh, François, uh, can you um, wrap up in the next, say, one or two minutes, please? Would that be possible for you? Yes, yes of course. I'm almost at the end. So the new system that is underway when we are executing the budget in the new system and also in the old system. So we will run both systems and we'll be able to qualify and vet the new system to make sure 
that it works properly. It's in a web architecture and it is possible to access it via internet. To conclude, I can say that the Ben, that, ben, that the information system Benin has greatly evolved in the years to come with the support of our partners. I think that there will be a revolution such that Benin will be seriously positioned sub-regionally, even worldwide, as a country with quite an advanced information system as regards municipalities uh, at the moment they are operating with systems that are quite diverse but the partners have been supporting us so that, such that we can have a, a one system that all will share thank you very much i'm very uh, willing to answer any questions you might have thank you so much um so we will take questions at the end hopefully we'll have about 30 minutes for q a so that would be great um and then if I can now turn to Sam from Nigeria. So Sam, you will know that um, the case study that we've developed on extending the institutional coverage, Nigeria is one of the countries that contributed. So I'd just like to understand more in terms of Nigeria's experience with extending the coverage of the GIFMAS to cover government owned entities. And a lot of countries are not, are, are considering doing this, but know that it's gonna be difficult. So can you tell us about some of the takeaways there? You're on mute, Sam. There you go. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. All right, um, so um, I'd like to provide a bit of background, then I'll go into some of the challenges, just so that I'm able to contextualize some of the uh, challenges and why it's peculiar also to, to Nigeria. Um, so it was in 2012, April, that um, the federal government launched the, you know, the use of you know, GIFMIS. Um, however, um, it was strictly for the MDAs, the spending MDAs of government, not necessarily for the GOEs. Um, and um, as at that time, it was only one of the subsystems of the GIFMIS that was being implemented, and that's the budget preparation subsystem. Uh, later on, you know, we then implemented, started implementing the budget execution subsystems just to ensure that uh, we remove the interface of humans when it comes to payments. Uh, we, had, we had noted that one of the reasons why we moved on to the GIFMIS was to, you know, um, to as much as possible minimize, you know, uh, rooms for corruption. Now, so the design of GIFMIS, you know, was first, you know, tailored in line with the development objectives and plans of government. Uh, so it was mainly amenable to the spending priorities of you know, of the MDAs. Uh, but in terms of expansion to, you know, GOEs, it's been challenging, and that's because of some fundamental issues. I, I would just like to highlight, uh, you know, just a few of them. Now, uh, in Nigeria, uh, we, we have three categorizations for the GOEs. There are those that are self-funded, uh, that is, they get no subvention from the federal government. There are those that are partially funded, uh, so in this case, the federal government funds, you know, uh, some one or more of the expenditure heads, and most like most often it's the personnel cost. And there are uh, those that are fully, you know, funded, you know, by government. So you have these three levels, you know, of the GOEs. Now the second major factor is that the act that establishes some of these GOEs defines their financial relations with governments. So some of the provisions in the act are at variance with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, now which stipulate that agencies should remit about 80% of the operating surplus. You know, this was modified to say, okay, 25% of gross revenues. And the reason was because when you say 80% of operating surplus, we see cases where uh, GOEs, you know, tend to, you know, uh, project higher revenues just so that they can, you know, um, estimate higher expenditures. And you know, when the law is passed, what then happens is that you are bound to, you know, to that expenditure item, even if your revenues you know, do not perform as much as you know, projected. And that was when government said, okay, do 25% of operating uh, of your gross revenues. Now, there is, we then have a new executive order that says, you know what, don't do 80% of operating surplus, 
don't do 25% of gross revenues. Just limit your cost first to 70% at most of your, you know, of your revenue. Then you can then do 80% or 25%, whichever is higher, you know, of the two. Now, so because of the peculiarities of the GOEs, what we have done in, is to, first of all, integrate those, those GOEs that are fully funded by government. That was pretty easy because this, this, these GOEs are also spending MDAs. And since they prepare their budget, they utilize the budget preparation subsystem to prepare their budget. We only expanded their, you know, their role and say, provide us now with information uh, relating to how much revenues you generate, you know, from your own operations and how you spend them. That was pretty, you know, uh, easier to, to do. Now, uh, it is only for the 2021 budget that we are trying to expand the use of, you know, IFMIS now to the GOEs that are partially funded. So we are not um, yet at the point where we, we are including those that are fully uh, funded. And that's because of some of the teaching issues I, I, I will talk about here. Now, one of the challenges that we've had is that we had to secure the buy-in of parliament. And the reason is this. Uh, traditionally, uh, agencies submit their budgets to the budget office but then they take a different you know, version of the budget you know, to, the, to the respective committees at the parliament for passage. And because they are not on GFPs, they are not bound by what they have submitted to us, rather by what has been passed by uh, parliament. So we have scaled that part uh, and we have the, you know, the buy-in of parliament to ensure that you know, every budget of GEO is now you know, has to be routed through uh, through the budget office. The second challenge has to do with modifying, you know, the appropriation bill format on GIFMIS. Uh, remember, because GIFMIS was tailored first, our, our own platform was tailored first to more of the spending um, MDAs of government, uh, we needed to, um, you know, initiate a change order request with our vendor, uh, that's HP, and um, and so there was a lot of teaching issues in terms of what needed to be modified in terms uh, on, on the platform. Uh, and, um, and, and that took um, quite a while. The other specific challenges relating to, you know, uh, expanding the coverage to this um, partially funded MDS includes the capacity, you know, for this geo is to also use um, uh, this platform since this is not something they have been, you know, they've been introduced to uh, before. Uh, and then issues relating to, to mobility and uh, training. We have a peculiar system here where uh, within the civil service, you know, you could be posted out of your, you know, current agency. And oftentimes that has been the case when you, when we train, you know, budget officers on the use of some of these uh, systems, um, they tend to live with that knowledge when they are posted out of service. So it's almost like, you know, going through the process of retraining, you know, new budget officers that um, take, out, take uh, over the, 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 you know, the, the role. Uh, but in terms of lessons, um, there, were, there were not much hurdles to, you know, to, you know, to scale when we had to expand to those GOEs that are um, fully funded. Um, for those that are partially funded, it is only for the 2021 budget that we are bringing them on the platform. And so until, we, until they use this, the system, um, we will not be able to know where we have missed you know, uh, some, some steps and, uh, and uh, what we could do uh, differently. Uh, currently, today, as, as I speak, we are just currently undergoing the user acceptance test. Uh, and um, those who are participating really is the vendor, that's the HP partner, the budget office, and, uh, and uh, personnel also from the Office of the Accountant General. 
We have not included the GOEs yet, participants from the GOEs who will be you know, using the platforms. Um, not at this point, because we are trying to still um, see and test the, um, test the, the modified platform to see if it will you know, admit um, the sort of data that we want to get you know, from the GOEs. After this um, user acceptance test, we will then you know, roll it out and then uh, expect that the agencies who will be involved will also uh, participate in, 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 in the test just before we, we roll it out for, for implementation. So for now, um, we just identified just a few of the challenges that we've met and um, we've, we've been able to scale some of them. Where the big problem will lie is when we have to roll it out to, you know, to those agencies that are self-funded. And that's because um, there's really very little incentive for them to, you know, uh, to be on board. But one way we think we'll overcome that is to, is to go the way of executive orders. Because these entities really are the agencies of government and it's, it's, the, it's the presidents who appoint um, either the CEOs or the MDs of those agencies. And so they are just doing business on behalf of government. So we, we believe that an executive order might be sufficient while we you know, work on um, modifying the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We should incorporate you know, all of all these things we are trying to do um, on GIFMIS. Um, in Nigeria, um, they, they hold dearly and very strongly you know, whatever comes out from the parliament. So um, besides the executive order, we are hoping that with the revision of the Fiscal um, um, Responsibility Act, some of these things will be embedded there just to ensure that it's concretized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. That was interesting. And I hope the executive order has the effect that you want on the, those SOEs with internally generated funds. Um, so if we can now turn to Mr. Gustavo. And I think Mr. Gustavo has pre prepared a presentation for us on how um, the information system in Argentina has assisted to maintain treasury operations during the COVID-19 crisis when social distancing was in place and the need to disperse funds more rapidly was greater than ever. So, um, Mr. Marino, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. I'm, I'm Gustavo Marino. I'm Director of Development in the General Direction of Financial Information System in Argentina. I want to thank GIFT and especially Kevry for letting me be part of this panel. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to share my screen now and let's talk. Can you see it's okay? Okay, let's go. Okay, uh, we are talking about how, uh, how can we uh, face with the situation of the COVID crisis. Uh, in March 2020, the COVID crisis uh, asked as a question, are the administration of Argentina uh, ready to work in a remote control mode? Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, what do we have in, what is the situation in that moment? We have a um, financial management information system that was, uh, that is being used by all the agencies that uh, are held by the national budget and uh, it is uh, fully interoperated with the bank system and with another uh, system like the procurement system and the debt system. So uh, we have uh, the situation, it seems to, have to be under control. Okay, there are, a, oh sorry, there are another system that are very important uh, ah, here are, sorry, here are some numbers uh, about the covers of our systems. We have, for example, 3,000 concurrent users that in our systems and over more than, for example, in 1929, uh, we have more than 1 million payments that was delivered, uh, uh, payment orders that were, were delivered uh, by the uh, through the system to the national uh, bank system. So, furthermore, Argentina has digitalized their electronic, their documental management system. So uh, there are no paper 
in the public administration so is, and all of the papers are they are signed by uh, in an electronic way and also the procurement system uh, is fully electronic and it is uh, and it is uh, fully interoperated with uh, with our fmis so it seems that we have uh, all all, all, re all resolved but not so quickly because FMIS requires access through VPN, virtual private network. So, in a, a because of security questions, so the user the users need to install a certificate to access from their homes. Some other operations need to be uh, digitally signed, and uh, we uh, we have not uh, got a remote. Uh, remote uh, sign system so uh, the user must use a, to a physical token a usb token so uh, it that needs a driver to operate properly and another operation for example sending payments to the bank needs to be done in a specific pieces located in the ministry so we have some issues to resolve another issue that we have is that a lot of user requires access to uh, local network drives on their PCs. Uh, oh. So, if, uh, I ask, if you can, and if you can just mute yourself if you're not speaking. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we need a remote. To, you, we need to give them remote access to their desk. And uh, in another situation, certain operations in data center should be a uh, presential so a uh, face to face so we need to ensure that uh, access to buildings and circulations or authorizations to some of our workers and on the other hand um, our help our help desk needs to operate remote without changing content information phone numbers were uh, bypassed to personal phones so what uh, have we done? We take some time to resolve the more uh, to ensure that critical business processes uh, uh, could be could be done. So we we solve the most critical issues like certificate access and so on, and then we launch a remote work project. A remote work project that uh, allows us to publish and distribute a guide of good practice of remote works to all of our users, to organize virtual courses to support uh, final user demands, to organize a poll, to, to run a poll, to ask our workers and users about remote work conditions, and uh, to make a procurement plan with considerations in order to be well prepared to the future in case of another another situation like this. Uh, and uh, another thing that, uh, that happens uh, was that uh, at the very beginning of the quarantine, uh, all of our users want to postpone the non-critical activities because uh, saying that it was impossible, impossible for us to continue uh, working uh, in uh, with remote uh, mode in non-critical activities, but time has passed and they realize and us realize that the the remote mode will be will be we are going to be a, a, a long time in home office. So uh, we began to organize uh, virtual activities in order to gather new requirements, making demos, and so on. So uh, we can continue with our planification. Okay, what are our challenges and our results? Uh, solving these issues and problems demand us an extreme effort, but crucial operations could continue without stopping. We could pay salaries seven days after a quarantine started and budget could be modified in order to uh, deliver some social new programs to attend the emergency. 
Uh, the 2019 URN report was delivered on time to the National Congress. The budget formulation process is happening in remote working time. The national government sent a, a, a huge budget modification to be discussed in the National Congress. And a subnational government, which use our systems, our system is used by two uh, subnational governments too, uh, they could continue with the business without problems. What are <coughs> the keys of success that we, that we can see here? The, one of the keys that we want to emphasize is that the OCOR PFM business processes uh, are supported by our FMIS. Uh, another key was that there was no need to sign uh, papers physical papers because of the electronic administrative and procurement systems the, that we had high level uh, commitment of our political authorities and uh, we have a dedicated team with great experience. Our general direction is an IT team dedicated only to FMIS. We, we, we don't do another kind of systems. The, we are uh, specialized in finance in financial management systems. So, oh, sorry. And uh, now I, I'm going to tell you briefly in a few slides, uh, what are we doing in, what are we doing about um, uh, the modernization of our FMIS? Oh, uh, this is, this is a lie. <laughs> so, uh, why change? Why change? Uh, we have launched. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. This is going. Two minutes, fast. please, Gustavo. Okay, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. I, I have uh, two or three slides more. We have uh, done an IT surveillance process, and we start an innovation lab in order to work with aspects uh, in the modernization. One of the acti oh, uh, I could stop there. Okay. Uh, sorry. Eh? Uh, we found four aspects to work with, uh, cloud-based systems, process innovation, new architectures, and data analytics. In cloud native, we want to use DevOps, or oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We want to use DevOps and OKD. In process innovation, we want to use design thinking and Lean and UXX. And in software architecture, we want to go to a microservice architecture and we want to, uh, even uh, that we have, uh, sorry, uh, even that we have now a, a business intelligence system, we want to, to find more in uh, data mining, to work more in data mining. So uh, the, our conclusion is that the modernization of, of our systems, that uh, we have to work in a modular approach we have uh, to work in how in in-house development because of our experience, but we need participation of consultants to help us in guiding in these new challenges. Uh, we need a high level commitment of the political authorities again, and uh, we have to do uh, innovation activities to face the innovation challenges. Because if you're going to fail, we, are, we need to fail fast in order to correct and continue. And that's it, sorry about the synchronization of the, of the presentation. Thank you very oh, much. No. It was incredibly interesting, actually inspiring for a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, so I wonder if Mr. McQuinde from Rwanda can also just come in quickly as a discussant, just to tell us about Rwanda's experience during lockdown and how um, payments process was streamlined and automated. Mr. McQuinder, would you mind just providing a, maybe a two-minute intervention on that, and then we'll bring in Nana Minta from Ghana.
you automated the process of using electronic document. Now, today the system is supporting the usage of electronic document. Where are um, some government entities, all government entities to send payment to the treasury are using ele only electronic document instead of using paper-based document. And the same is being done uh, because on the improving the how to authenticate this document, we are applying electronic signatures. As I showed you, Ali, the payroll, the current payroll, starting with this month, all the payrolls are being signed actually electronically without any normal signature or stamp. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. McQuinder. Very useful, but very succinct. Um, so if I can now bring in Nana Minta from Ghana. So Nana is the head of the Budget Technical Assistance and Support Unit in the Ministry of Ghana. And Nana, if I can ask you two questions. Um, firstly, if you can reflect on existing data capabilities and gaps amongst the different design and maintenance teams, public finance data managers, data capturers, data end users, and how you feel that um, capacity building programs in Rwanda respond to identified gaps. And then after that, if you wouldn't mind speaking about the, um, a tool that's very close to my heart because I was somewhat involved in it, but if you can also provide us background to the budget implementation and status monitoring system. So how this came about, its objectives, um, and yeah, whether there are plans to integrate it at some stage with the GIFMAS. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, great to see you again, uh, like you made mention, and I'm glad to talk about the budget implementation system uh, as well. Um, but I'll just touch base on the give me design, the maintenance team, the public financial data manager, the data captures and data end users um, as well. So we have implemented this for over eight years now and um, we have actually um, learned some few uh, lessons uh, with this. Some of the main challenges actually has been with the movement of persons from institutions and being assigned new roles and especially uh, that has got to do with capacity building. Um, you have you have training, consistent, constant trainings and then some persons move up the hierarchy now that gap, now a new gap is created. You train another person for four years, and you have another person being promoted and then moving up the hierarchy. But when it comes to the capability as to maintain the system from in-house, we've also um, been able to train a lot of um, people to actually do this. We've, we have an in-house technical team, and uh, we normally call on some expertise based on some challenges that sometimes we have. But I would say that for the first level, second level of support, uh, which has to do with um, system maintenance, updates, backups, uh, actually done in-house. Um, but with the implementation of certain models, sometimes we need certain um, consultants or certain experts to actually come in to assist us as well. When it comes to data capture, it's still got to do with capacity. Um, that has been our Achilles heel um, from time to time. So we are actually putting in measures to be able to now address some of these challenges that we have um, when it comes to capacity building. The challenge is trying to understand sometimes the chart of account as being implemented on our financial systems. And it takes some time. We have, I, I don't know about some other countries, but I think we have some of the biggest uh, when it comes to the size of the segments. We are looking at 12 segments, 74 digits, and then now trying to ar arrive at several combinations from these 12 segments. And it's a bit challenging for some of the users to be able to get a grasp of this as well. Um, that's been our main challenges, but we've been building capacity in this regard. In these times, um, I'll just touch briefly on these times as well. Um, We've had 
some challenges, especially with VPN, just like Gustav actually mentioned in his presentation, we now have to rearrange some of our um, staff to be able to now be able to use um, this VPN and be able to get access and work from the home. People are now getting used to some of these new technologies and new happenings within this time. So we've had some few challenges in, in there as well. Often at times, uh, some people would pop up uh, in the office just to do some few things because some people are still not used to some of um, these new ways of actually working. And challenges got to do with access. Um, some some live a bit in remote, some remote areas, and they're not able to have a very good stable connectivity uh, to these uh, systems. But all in all, some are, some are still trying to um, uh, learn these new processes and are able to now uh, actually uh, use the system as well. So Daniel, can I uh, if, can I just go into the budget implementation? Uh, system. Go ahead. Well. Go ahead. Okay. So the budget implementation status and monitoring system. Um, this uh, with the help of our coach and then our uh, Daniel, who was our coach as at that time, we were able to now design this system. We had a lot of backing from our authorizers to be able to do this. Um, in the budget division of the Ministry of Finance, we generate a lot of information. Um, not just financial information, but some other non-financial information as well. So very much at time, trying to have a linkage of this non-financial and this financial information to make a decision on some transactions, now becomes challenging. So now we're able to now um, meet all the stakeholders when it comes to these financial transactions and the budget implementation or execution process to identify what the gaps actually is and causes the delay in the implementation of the budget. We're able to now identify some few gaps, such as um, the non-financial data, which sits with individual uh, offices and as such, getting that information becomes difficult. So we, de we designed a system which is now able to pick the non-financial information and also the financial information and have it go through a hierarchy. So there will be, there's someone who actually captures the data, someone who reviews this data, and someone who actually picks this data for reporting. So this has actually been done and um, this has been implemented. Um, we have users, all the users in the budget division of the Ministry of Finance being trained on this. Data has been captured. So as we, we have these discussions now, we have data up to date currently on that system and it's now been launched and it's live uh, in, in the premises of the Ministry of Finance. Our challenge currently is to acquire a secured um, socket layer, that's the SSL, just like uh, Gustavo also mentioned in his uh, presentation, to now be able to get users to securely connect the system from wherever they are in their homes, uh, their holidays, now to be able to assess information and then also be able to um, make informed decisions about uh, the budget as being implemented. Um, with the connection to the GIFMIS database, um, yes, we plan to do that, but currently we, um, using the budget implementation to monitoring, actually have a bit more information than what's actually on the financials in that we have users capturing the financial information and the non-financial information. Going forward, we plan to integrate to get the financial information from the GIFMIS into the budget implementation status monitoring software. And then we can now link the financials to the non-financials in one, um, one setting and then the director of budgets the sector heads and all the other officers who have this information available to them in real time. That's what we want to do going forward into 2021 as part of our business processes as well. Great, thanks so much, Anna. Really interesting. Sam, if I can turn to you again, this will be the last question before we open up to questions that have been posted in the chat box. If you can just, within two minutes, tell us how, um, how your GIFMIS supports the new Open Treasury portal and whether there are existing gaps in the information captured by the OHE 
and MDAs in the gift that actually negatively impact the um, open transparency portal. And um, if you can, what would you say that countries need to get right with their existing information systems before going ahead and introducing open budget platforms? All right, thank you, Danielle. Thank you again. Um, so um, first, I would like to note that um, we only launched the open treasury portal in December 2019. So we are like eight months old. All right, um, so uh, in terms of how um, GIFME supports the, you know, uh, the OTP, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the GIFME is the major feeder of the OTP in terms of information and data, um, payments and financial transactions of government, audits, you know, government transactions, because we have a role for the Auditor General there. Um, so, also with respect to fiscal transparency in public financial management. And uh, uh, so, and broadly, you know, uh, everything that has to do with what we are doing on our PFM reform side. Uh, so we have major players there. And since they are all, you know, um, um, they all have rules on GIFME. So it's pretty straightforward that GIFME provides the backbone data that goes into, into the um, OTP. And uh, our expectation is that, you know, as GIFMIS has been expanded to, you know, uh, to all GOEs, even though we're doing it on an incremental basis, uh, we, we, sh we, we should see, you know, more connections relating to uh, accountability and fiscal transparency in our, you know, overall PFM system. And then, uh, and that would be largely supported by, you know, the connections between uh, GIFMIS and, uh, and the OTP. Now, with respect to if there are gaps, you know, or descriptive discrepancies, you know, in the, in the information captured between the Office of the Accountant General and the MDAs, yes, yes, there are gaps. And, um, and there are a number of reasons uh, for that. Now, um, on our side, um, we, we use the budget uh, preparation subsystems on GIFMIS to prepare the budget. We also use the execution subsystem. However, uh, not all payments are made, you know, uh, via GIFMIS. There are still some payments that go outside uh, chief needs. So some manual authorizations, uh, you know, uh, still happen, especially on the security sector. Um, uh, and until we're able to also close that gap, you know, we'll still be seeing some of those variations. Uh, and uh, besides that, you also have some other <clears throat> extra budgetary costs that are not, you know, reported or captured on chief needs. And so um, with that, you tend to see uh, those, stuff, those sort of uh, uh, variances. Again, uh, one of the other reasons why we have, you know, um, um, the, the gaps again in, in the reports between the um, Office of the Accountant General and the MDAs is that some of the MDAs are not um, on GIFMIS, uh, particularly those that are on the first line charge. Uh, some of them include like the Parliament, uh, the Judicial Commission, Human Rights Commission, and uh, the Independent National, uh, National Electoral uh, Commission. These ones, you know, draw their money as first line charges from government treasury, even before government begins to fund, you know, other activities that it has. And then uh, the, the last thing that we see also is the lack of sufficient narration or description, you know, of the financial uh, transactions. So these sort of things tend to create uh, uh, the gaps between uh, the information posted by the uh, OAGF and then the and, and the MDAs, uh, and then <clears throat> uh, I think that um, the challenges that country face, you know, we are, are unique, and that will also determine, you know, what sort of um, um, approach they will want to adopt in terms of um, dealing with, you know, their peculiarities. Uh, on our side, um, since we have only, you know, um, rolled out the BPS and the DES, you know, of the, of the GIFMIS. Um, we still have, you know, two other modules that are hanging, like the monitoring and reporting, as well as the human resource components uh, uh, within GIFMIS. So um, one of the first recommendations, you know, that, you know, comes to mind is that, uh, first, all payments should be routed through, through GIFMIS, and uh, that can help close, you know, gaps between information reporting. And then, then the, the need to guarantee synergy among 
among MDAs, especially when it comes to uh, data, data sharing, all right? Um, because some activities actually cut across uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, MDAs. I, I say that with respect to um, one of the you know, major line items, we, we, we make provisions to like the, uh, which we keep under the service-wide votes. And the service-wide votes actually houses, you know, some spendings that go to, to the MDAs, that the MDAs benefits from, that cut across, you know, the different um, uh, uh, MDAs. Uh, for instance, your, the, the public service weight adjustments, you know, there's a provision there that uh, should there be, you know, some increases or some promotions, area, some, um, you know, med media promotion that happened. Okay, uh, it is from these votes that you know um, payments payments are made. So those ones are not necessarily embedded within the budgets of the MDAs. But when payments are made in respect of those MDAs, it is reported by the OAGFs and may not have been captured by the respective MDAs themselves. Uh, we have you know a number of those sort of items under the service-wide um, um, votes. Then, Thanks. Um, oh, sorry. You want to wrap up quickly? Okay. Yes, just um, three seconds. So lastly, um, it, something that has to do with the personnel. You know, I, I think there is need for um, a personnel, you know, that will be charged with the responsibility of reviewing and approving information that's posted also on the OTP, you know, just to ensure some level of consistency, you know, before they are uh, uploaded. Um, that way, you could we, we could minimize um, some of those uh, uh, gaps and discrepancies that we find. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. All right, so let's get to some of the questions. I mean, there's a really interesting one from our, from our lock here, and it has sort of been asked, answered by Mr. McQuendy, but I just wanted to go um, into it a bit more in terms of how IT professionals are procured for developing the EFMAs. And whether there's any government IT department involved and what's the level of involvement. What's also really interesting is in Ethiopia, where the Ministry of Finance and Economic uh, Economy and Development is actually in discussions currently with the Ministry of Higher Education and the Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Science, to incorporate the configuration and use of IFMAS into higher education institutions curricula. And um, Mr. McQuinda said that's the same in Rwanda, but the, the thing that's interesting in Ethiopia is that they add to that, um, moving beyond just the IT skills and looking at um, how to manipulate data, how to capture process and use information for reporting and decision making. And I think the emphasis on that is going to become increasingly, increasingly important now and as we move closer towards big data and digitalization. Mr. McQuinda, is there anything you wanted to add there? Okay. Uh, thank you, Danny. Uh in fact, uh, when it comes to uh, recruiting competent staff in line with the infamous technical skill set, it's not an easy task. I personally, I used to be a lecturer in the university before joining the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and what actually was done in Rwanda, Rwanda before embarking on the automation of different systems, actually they used to send a bright student abroad, first of all. And now, whenever those they came back, they are, we had a combination of a foreign expatriate, expat to come and join the local team, which did not have enough experience. And now they started developing different systems. Now, however, what was done is in collaboration with the institution in charge of regulating software development and so on, we had to choose a precise set of technologies. You'll find that technologies that are being used in Ephemis Rwanda, they are the one being used in e-procurement, they are the one new being used in developing another platform in the government, and the same technology are being taught in university. Another thing that was done by the government is to bring international universities here, locally here. Like the Carnegie Mellon University is present in Kigali. And you understand now, the same, they are the one who we are, are being employed by the Minister of Finance. 
However, during the recruitment, for example, it's my responsibility as the head of IFIMIS to recruit competent staff. No other uh, agency is involved. It's simply the re responsibility of the Minister of Finance. I think I'm answering the question, Daniel. No, very well, thank you so much. So I think let's turn to Benin and ask um, a question that was about, can you, uh, well, let's do a few questions at the same time, which is, can you explain your approach to achieving high interoperability? Um, and also, will the system be server or cloud-based? And will maintenance be done in-house? So those are quite simple questions, I think, for Francois to answer. Okay, merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you, thank you very much. With respect uh, to Benin, our interoperability policy uh, has been uh, really uh, sorted out now with the system because now it it's a fully integrated system and for preparing, uh, executing uh, everything that deals with public accounting and financial management for it can be used with other uh, systems and services, such as the SIGTAS system. We are going to have a web service. And in fact, this was also done um, so that all um, uh, information in these systems can be automatically transferred. And this is the same for uh, payroll, uh, payrolls and, and, and pension payments. Now, in terms of where it's going to be housed, we think First of all, that we'll be putting it in the cloud initially, because at the Ministry of Finance, we have a data center, but the government is also building now a national level data center, and that's hopefully, that'll hopefully be done by the end of next year. So we're, uh, uh, we've got the system in the cloud for the moment, for the time being, until the data centers are built. I think those are the two questions, right? But uh, there was another question, I think, about uh, public uh, companies and how they're integrated. For the time being, the new system does not take into account public companies. That's something that we're thinking about and we're still analyzing uh, to see uh, how we can do that. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. Thanks for adding that extra question. I didn't notice that. So. Um, and Nana, I think you wanted to come in also in terms of the capacity building. Um, do you, was that specific to the university or what did you want to add? Okay, um, for us, we've tried some of those approaches and we are still having a huge challenge with them. Um, just um, like Rwanda is doing, we've tried that approach where we went to universities and got some of um, the guys to join us. Um, when they come in um, and they come in to support custom built applications, uh, they tend to stay longer. When they come in to support um, other um, enterprise ap applications uh, from other vendors uh, known worldwide, after three, four years of experience, they, they tend to move because they get to have, they get to, um, they get offers which are better than what government is actually um, supporting them with, and they will definitely leave. We've had um, we've had some persons come in, some students come in um, from the universities. They work with us for four or five years, supporting some uh, applications. After five years, the offer that they had from some other companies uh, in the states, government there was no way government could have matched those offers. So we've had people come in from the universities, we've had people come in to, from um, other areas to support. But once they have this kind of experience and then um, they, they get an offer, it's very difficult for them to stay. Those who came to support custom built applications tend to stay longer. They tend to um, stay on and then work so the application is still being used or being implemented efficiently. But those supporting enterprise systems where there are other opportunities elsewhere, it's very difficult to actually maintain, actually have them work for government for that long period that, I mean, you'd expect them to stay, like for six, seven, eight years. Maximum I have seen is five years 
and they are gone. We are having a huge challenge with that, especially with some of the enterprise systems as well. And I would really want to know um, if uh, Rwanda is actually using a custom built application or they're using uh, an enterprise application of the self application, which they're actually implementing. I know Ethiopia is doing the same. They are using uh, something from Oracle. So I really want to know how that process really works with them because for us, we've tried that and we had a lot of challenges with it as well. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll be ready and listening to what happens in Ethiopia versus what is actually happening in uh, Rwanda in line if they are using a custom built, a home developed application um, by them or they are getting something from a company and then we actually designing and deploying this uh, for usage as well. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Mr. McQuinn, do you want to very quickly come in? I did want to ask some questions to Nigeria. We've got about three, but we are running out of time. So Mr. McQuinn, if you can be very quick in response to Anna. Uh, okay. Um, uh, as I explained, actually in Rwanda, to we started the first approach by hiring a company. It was an American company. However, the contract was, the company is going to train local people. Now, the local staff, they are going to work together to develop the first version of FMS. Now, during the development, they developed. However, they didn't transfer the knowledge as we expected. Now, we had to first terminate the contract of that company. Then we said we are going to reverse the approach. Instead of hiring a company, we said, let's hire expert. Now, in this case, what we, we changed, we said, instead of using a, uh, people who are trained in the local university, let's take those bright students who are trained abroad so that at least they have the same skill set with those experts, even if they don't have the same kind of experience. I, I was uh, recruited among those uh, students, oh, sorry, those staff. Then we started developing. Myself, I was in charge of the design. And uh, we started development, the development in 2014. And uh, in 2015, we started the live operation of the system. Now, to maintain this stuff, what we, we did, the government actually in Rwanda, because Rwanda, the policy is to be a knowledge-based economy because we don't have uh, enough resources. Now, the IT was given priority. IT in the, all sectors, if you are an IT person, you get an extra $150 to your pay role compared to other employees. Now, in the Ministry of Finance, they added another extra layer so that IT staff, they got even more so that at least they can retain those IT skills. However, uh, reaching in the 20, uh, in 2017, after we, the IFIMIS was very successful and the, the government was, we, it gave us a mandate of developing an other product. Not only IFIMIS, even other product. Now, that's when we started experiencing a turnover. Not a turnover, a high turnover in local companies. However, high turnover in USA. Now, people started running to the USA. However, because the university was producing uh, uh, students who are mastering those technologies, we had to recruit them here and to train them to our framework so that they understand the EFIMIS. We take actually on average three months to six months for somebody to understand really if you miss. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll have lots more time on the, at the online workshop on data capabilities to discuss this. But we do have another session now. So I'm gonna hand over 
to Raquel to close us up. But thank you so much to the panelists. You were all excellent. Thank you so much for everyone who joined us. Um, thank you, Danielle. And uh, once again, thank you to you and Neil from Cabri for leading the session for us and facilitating it so well. Um, to Benin, Nigeria, Argentina, Rwanda and Ghana, thank you very much for sharing your presentations and a very thought provoking um, experiences with us. We really do appreciate it. Hello? I'm not sure why. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, perfectly. Okay, I'm not sure where um, you lost me there. Um, so I was basically saying thank you very much to Cadbury, to Danielle and Neil for leading and facilitating this very interesting discussion. To the presenters from Benin, Nigeria, Argentina, Rwanda and Ghana, Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. We have a wealth of information that we have gathered here um, and uh, it will assist us going forward. To all of the participants in this session, thank you very much for your interesting questions um, and your lively interactions. Um, thank you, have a good day further and hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.